So hi, my name's Shauna Malloy. I'm a paediatric intensive care trainee, and I'm here to tell you why the video laryngoscope is superior. It's fact. But also, and most importantly, I'm here to kick Simon's butt. And I hear on social media there might be a wee air track prize, so I'm hoping for this scope. So video laryngoscopy has been available for a little more than 20 years. It provides a fab view of the glottis that you can take the credit for it and can show off to your colleagues as you intubate the most difficult kids and you walk away feeling good. Seriously though, they are so versatile. You can use them according to airway difficulty, choose the shape of the blade you want, an acute angle versus a Macintosh blade versus a Miller type blade. And you can even be lazy and choose the scope with a channel to hold and guide the tracheal tube through the cords. I mean, there's so many options. Over the last decade, and the video laryngoscope has emerged with a bang in adult training and has been labelled as best practice amongst the most highly regarded clinicians. I mean, I think it soon will be considered standard of care when intubating kids, especially those with the more challenging airways. Look, we all know we work in peds. Those little faces and mouths have all been major stumbling blocks that companies have had to overcome, having to formulate devices of a suitable size to facilitate our teeniest and tiniest. From a difficult airway point of view, the emergence has enabled anaesthetists and even us little paediatricians to intubate the most difficult of airways. Its introduction has provided us with an all-inclusive view of the airway, resulting in a superior appreciation for the anatomy and offering an expanded, high-resolution view for all in comparison with a blind, tell-me-what-you-see approach. So I reckon video laryngoscopes are up there in our paediatric artillery, standing tall beside the almighty Calpol and Eurofen. We know the differences between the paediatric and adult airway exist. Big head, large tongue, anterior cords. Now, we'll not explode their heads as we know the humble anaesthetists would just get too shy, but you have to admit, they are knowledgeable and experienced in the techniques of direct laryngoscopy. I mean, they spend seven years perfecting their skills. Granted, probably six of them is in the tea room on their coffee breaks, but nevertheless, if you're taking the time to become clinically adept, a paediatric video laryngoscope should we as paediatricians not follow by example. Like, the scale does differ between direct and video, and I'm not alone in, in thinking that video laryngoscopy mainly is easier. The technique of mouth opening is similar and henceforth can be as striking as the work of David Attenborough. The humbling video laryngoscope is inserted midline, safe from the wrath of the giant floppy tongue. You view the monitor as the blade gently lifts and you advance until the larynx just becomes beautifully visible. Now you might need a wee bit of burp to perfect the picture and you might need a wee bit of training in the fine details of hand-eye coordination but the nuances of video laryngoscopy can be acquired quickly with a bit of practice. Now, there are stacks of video laryngoscopes commercially available for the use of peds. I'm going to talk about a few that I've used and a bit of the boring evidence. Warning, disclaimer, now, I'm categorically 100% not getting any money whatsoever for the promotion of any scopes talked about today, unfortunately. But I suppose just beating Simon is probably a reward enough. The McGrath, I love it. Familiar and transferable skills. There's been numerous case reports documenting the successful intubation in neonatal and paediatric practice. Ross and his mates reviewed its use in anaesthetic practice and found it superior in infants down to as small as 800 grams. They particularly liked its similarity to learned practice in terms of blade, device and technique and allowed for the magnified view to facilitate training among even the most junior of colleagues. It has been used successfully in kids with extensive burns and scarring to the face and neck, resulting in grade one views. Tell me, when you think of a difficult airway, I mean, I always think of things like Trickshire Collins, and this scope has been successfully used when previous conventional attempts have failed, converting the grade four view into a grade one. Mannequin studies have demonstrated encouraging results, considering the McGrath to be faster and allowing a higher rate of first attempt intubation success rates, even during ongoing chest compressions and in immobilized cervical spinal patients. They recommend McGrath as the first intubation option for the endotracheal intubation during pediatric emergencies. It is an enhanced direct laryngoscope which allows me, the operator, to see a direct and indirect view of the airway using the traditional curved Mac blade. So boom, there you go Simon, double whammy, this scope even does both, your case is closed already. The C-Mac, well it's amazing, we've all used it. 
It's a non-channeled video laryngoscope that can be fitted with various Macintosh and Miller style blades, including the Miller Zero and One. You know those wee toy blades that the neonatologists play with? But among the literature, success has been highlighted in kids with challenging genetics, difficult airways like Trudeau Collins, as we mentioned, and C-spine injuries and limited neck extension. It's lightweight, compact system, which we still get the familiarity of the Miller and the Mac blades, but it has an amazing picture. It's even able to facilitate a handy pocket monitor that Dr. Chris Flanagan has promised going to get me when I become a consultant. Overall, there was better success rates in various neonatal studies, even down in this stage to 500 grams, helping to prevent repeat attempts due to likely an improved anatomical view. I mean, a grade three view with direct has been magically transformed into a grade one with the video. Our ED colleagues, even without extensive anesthetic training, prospectively looked at their success rates over a 10 year period and found that children less than 18 years in an emergency intubation situation, the CMAC was associated with higher first pass success without adverse effects when compared with the direct. I mean, we've even been able to diagnose vocal cord paresis and tiny premies with the CMAC, which let's face it, when you're using a direct in a 500 gram kid, you're just so happy you're getting through them non-functional cords that you're not noticing anything else. Next up, the air track. Now, I must admit, I wouldn't have as much experience with these, but I'm sure I'll become established when I won one later. It is a, channel, a channeled video laryngoscope, which can be used as a direct or indirect with a wireless monitor. It comes in two pediatric sizes and can pass as small as a two and a half ET tube. Unique to the air track, though, there's a channel for directing the ET through the vocal cords, so it does the job for you. I mean, some people do say it's tough going in kids with limited mouth opening, like in Pierre Raban, because of its relatively large blade. But in simulated mannequin studies of pediatric patients with grade four view of the glottis, the air track proves superior to the standard MAC. Furthermore, in a study of uh, novices using Pierre Raban simulated mannequin design, the air track led to shorter duration of intubation attempts as compared with even the galitoscope. Various studies have reported less time to intubation, improved visualization, and smaller number of esophageal intubations. Granted, the evidence regarding the utilization of the air track is mostly in normal airways rather than the difficult airway in the pediatric cohort. So I look forward to creating some evidence when I won this prize later. Don't worry, Simon, I'll give you a wee go. And finally, just to touch on the almighty Galitoscope. Introduced in PAIDS in 2005, it has evolved massively. The non-channeled galitoscope is a camera mounted on a specially shaped laryngoscope handle with an acutely angled blade utilizing indirect vision. The shape of the blade allows intubation without neck movement and making it a class choice for, for intubation in patients with limited neck movement. In the recent Pediatric Difficult Intubation Registry, assessing the efficacy of the galitoscope and the direct for intubation in near 1,300 kids with anticipated difficult intubation on initial attempt, galitoscope flew it, the higher success rate, a far higher success rate than direct without increasing complications. I'm delighted to say that myself and many of my colleagues have inc incorporated the use of video laryngoscopy into routine and emergency airway management and the intensive care environment. Based upon mannequin studies, even beginners can achieve high success rates for intubation, 95 to 100% when using video laryngoscopes. Intubation skills gained can be transferred to the use of the standard laryngoscope when the video scope configuration is similar. It just permits effective surveillance of trainees performing endotracheal intubation and especially amongst us pediatricians, like I don't know about you, but my first attempt at intubation was on a 500 gram premature baby. And it was basically consisted of being handed a laryngoscope and being told to go. Like it was not a success. And as a very high achiever, and I don't like to lose, Simon, it was tough. Therefore, the scope of educational practice is immense, unique, and essential for my confidence in all around us. Now I know us intensivists are probably the most highly skilled now in the hospital, but even we aren't afraid to admit that paediatric airways can be challenging. Evidence states that the smaller the child, the more difficult the airway. As evidence, the video laryngoscope has so many advantages. 
For the patient, better success rates and first pass, especially when challenging airway anatomy, less risk of esophageal intubation, less oral trauma, less C-spine movement and less hemodynamic compromise from intubation. For ourselves, there has been a breakthrough for education and novices who train with video laryngoscopy are proven to adapt and learn direct faster. I know there's criticism that some video laryngoscopes are associated with increased intubation time, but there's so many emerging on the market that one must use your expertise and experience to adapt your instruments to benefit the patient. Use a different scope. We know blah, 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 blood, excessive secretions in the oral cavity and pharynx will make visualization difficult. But let's face it, it's not as if you can see much with a Mac with a mouth full of blood. Look, I'm not saying throw the direct laryngoscope out, but for me, I'm first choice for patient care. My vote is for video. Boom, put that in your Mac and smoke it, Simon. Hello, my name is Simon Jackson. I'm a paediatric ICU trainee based between Belfast and Liverpool. Firstly, for those who can understand the Derry accent, I'm sure they'll appreciate that was a great talk by Shauna. Secondly, thank you to Dr. Flanagan for asking us to speak today. I'm here to support the use of direct laryngoscopy for intubating critically ill children. I'm happy to admit I prefer using video laryngoscopy compared to direct laryngoscopy. However, I hope to convince you that it's really important that everybody who intubates ill children should train and be able to undertake direct laryngoscopy. To answer the question, critically ill children should be intubated using video laryngoscopy, I'm going to explain to you, firstly, why we should be intubating critically ill children by direct laryngoscopy, and secondly, that the evidence base tells us there are good boundaries in which to train and perform direct laryngoscopy. So I'm a paediatrician by trade, and I undertook anaesthetic training as part of paediatric ICU training. My anaesthetic training has occurred during COVID times, so we were largely discouraged from using direct laryngoscopy in adults and encouraged to use video laryngoscopy. Video laryngoscopy is an excellent tool for training purposes and having somebody provide real-time encouragement, advice and feedback is fantastic. I imagine a large proportion of paediatric ICU trainees and future trainees will train mostly or exclusively with video laryngoscopy and in the future most patients will probably be intubated by video laryngoscopy. However, heavily training and using video laryngoscopy concerns me. I think it puts a small amount of children at risk of harm. The reason for this is something that we have all experienced, which is that technology can fail. Video laryngoscopes can fail when we need them the most and put your patient at risk and leave, leave you in a tight spot. Direct laryngoscopes can have faults too, but they're easy to check, fix and replace and are a more dependable tool. This is well demonstrated to me last week when I was supervising a trainee using video laryngoscopy for intubating an ill child and the battery failed mid-procedure. As they were less familiar with direct laryngoscopy, I had to take over and complete the intubation. This is something I prepared for. Because my training was primarily in video laryngoscopy, I recognised I wasn't as good at direct laryngoscopy as I should be. I knew that at some time I'd be in a position where I may be in an unfamiliar ward or environment and I'd have to intubate an ill child without my favourite video laryngoscope being available, and I'll be handed a direct laryngoscope that I may not be well trained to use. That's why I went and reviewed the literature and determined what patients I would train and focus on intubating by direct laryngoscopy. So if you're a clinician who regularly intubates, you need to be able to master the circumstances you're in and be competent using the tools available. It is your responsibility to keep your patients safe, so direct laryngoscopy is a skill you should be maintaining. So what does the evidence base say about whether direct or video laryngoscopy is superior for intubating ill children? The only paediatric ICU study examining intubation practice was a large retrospective review which occurred within multiple international paediatric ICUs. This assessed direct and video laryngoscopy in ill children and measured adverse outcomes. It was demonstrated that video laryngoscopy significantly reduced less severe adverse events, including esophageal intubation with immediate recognition. However, video laryngoscopy demonstrated no significant difference compared to direct laryngoscopy in the amount of attempts to successfully intubate or in the occurrence of severe adverse events, which included cardiac arrest. So this sole paediatric ICU study does not persuade me that I would be harming my patients by using direct laryngoscopy. So are there any other studies which may have found direct laryngoscopy causes harm? In short, one cohort study conducted in a single A&E department and a meta-analysis of RCTs on elective, well, surgical children demonstrated no significant difference in performance or adverse events between devices. So what else is known? Difficult laryngoscopy occurs more under one year of age and that's been reported to occur between 1 in 25 to 1 in 400 cases, so relatively frequently. The NAP4 report highlighted that approximately a quarter of major airway events occurred in ICU or A&E departments. 
not foreknoted that paediatric morbidity occurred in anticipated difficult airways and in a small number of unanticipated healthy children, the paediatric difficult intubation registry and the National Emergency Airway Registry for Children have established risk factors for difficult intubation. These include weight less than 10 kilograms, more than two direct laryngoscopy attempts, three direct laryngoscopy attempts before attempting video laryngoscopy, history of difficult airway, signs of upper airway obstruction, microgonathia. Other studies have highlighted risk factors including syndromic children, children intubated for cardiac surgery or maxofacial surgery, and malampati class three or four. So as a trainee, I've established that I need to train with direct laryngoscopy, but I do not want to put myself or patients at risk unnecessarily. So I've used the evidence to determine when I will use direct laryngoscopy. I believe if I train within these boundaries, when I need to intubate with direct laryngoscopy outside these boundaries, I'll be more likely to be successful. The boundaries I use to guide my practice are, firstly, I automatically try to use video laryngoscopes when I'm outside of my familiar environment of paediatric ICU, or a child is peri-arrest, or there's an anticipated difficult airway. Secondly, I automatically try to use direct laryngoscopy in all other patients, but I'm mindful of when patients have only been intubated by video laryngoscopy before, or if a child is less than one year or less than 10 kilograms, I still use direct laryngoscopy, but I'm aware failure risks are increased. And I quickly change my plan B of video laryngoscopy early if the first attempts with direct laryngoscopy are unsuccessful. So in conclusion, whether we like it or not, if you intubate, you have to be able to undertake direct laryngoscopy because no matter what systems we have to prevent video laryngoscopes not working, these systems can fail and we need to be able to use direct, direct laryngoscopy to prevent harm to our patients. Anybody who's seen Jurassic Park will appreciate that safety procedures and equipment can fail. Thank you.